Thank you everyone who is joining us. We have a couple of announcements as you're all logging in. First, you'll notice that this session allows you to have your cameras and mics on. So we ask that you follow our presenter's lead for when to do so. Next, if you'd like to ask a question during the session, please make sure to use the Q&A area to the right of the viewing window. Looks like we're getting, we're ready to start. So I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers to begin. Uh, thanks, Melibea. Um, first of all, I am going to introduce myself. My name is Brittany Gronke, and I am the Director and General Manager of DoorDash Drive's government and nonprofit team. Um, my team focuses on partnering with uh, nonprofits in, in, uh, in that last mile part of, of distribution and, and solicit fulfillment, and I'm excited to share a little bit more about that today. Julie, do you want to kind of briefly introduce yourself, introduce yourself as well? Sure. My name is Julie Yurko, and I serve as president and CEO of Northern Illinois Food Bank, and we have the privilege of working together with Brittany and her team on making sure all of our neighbors have enough food, and we're going to talk all about that in the next few minutes. Thanks, Julie. Um, for the session, um, please feel free, liberally use the chat and the Q&A. Um, uh, Julie and I have the fortune of, of also being friends, and so we're eager to kind of answer your questions and, and, and consider this kind of a helpful discussion more broadly. But we'll dive into the details and, and again, look forward to kind of the conversation towards the end of the session. Um, so first of all, the name of the session is Leveraging DoorDash's Last Mile Logistics to Broaden Food Access. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more um, in the following slides about the work we do, and then Julie is going to share a little bit of a specific use case in which we partnered with Northern Illinois Food Bank um, at the tail end of the presentation. So to start, um, hopefully most of you are familiar with DoorDash. Um, DoorDash, um, you might not be familiar though with our mission. Our mission is to grow and empower local economies. And so what that looks like today is that we connect um, nearly a half a million merchants, so it's restaurants, grocers, um, retailers, food banks, um, to over 20 million consumers, and over 1 million dashers are in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Japan that work and operate on our local logistics platform. Um, what's really exciting about the work that we do is that we don't just do deliveries for restaurants anymore. We also power deliveries for retail, for grocery convenience, um, and like I said, we're really excited, and my team is most specifically excited in the way that we're partnering with food banks um, today and the way that we anticipate partnering with, with um, food banks increasingly in, in the months and years to come. To share a little bit about the reach that DoorDash has, currently uh, DoorDash's platform has the ability to reach about 95% of the United States population. Um, we do this through the 1 million dashers that are on the road every single day, and we've actually achieved this summer 2 billion orders completed which means we've been able to really leverage and utilize and learn from all these different deliveries to be able to determine how we can do these both most efficiently and very much with both the consumer, the end recipient of the delivery, as well as the merchant, the um, retailer, restaurant, grocer, food bank um, in mind, as well as the dasher, the ability to make sure we're providing um, a, a seamless experience for everybody from a last mile perspective. So how does this relate to food banks and food access and food insecurity? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how our platform works across two essentially different um, different uh, use cases and specifically the one in which my team, um, uh, the drive team, ends up focusing. So for those of you, again, who are DoorDash consumers, potentially you have the DoorDash app on your phone. We refer to that as the marketplace. So essentially that's marketing and demand generation. We're engaging new consumers and new customers for restaurants and grocers and retailers through the DoorDash app. Additionally, there's a separate um, part of DoorDash referred to as DoorDash Drive. This is our white label delivery um, platform that enables all of our restaurants, grocers, food banks to be able to have a direct relationship with their um, consumer or their client or their neighbor. And so DoorDash is the last mile provided, providing the fulfillment and the delivery between the two, but we are not necessarily connecting the two in the first place in the same way that we are in the marketplace. Now, my team, as I mentioned, we focus on delivering for good. And so what does that mean and what does that look like? We're increasingly working on becoming a familiar name across nonprofit organizations and government agencies. And so as you can see on this, uh, on this slide, we've had the privilege of working with many of these organizations for well over a year. And DoorDash has actually been committed to this work for about three years, but following the pandemic, really the need and the demand surge and the interest to be able to have um, greater access and easier access for last mile delivery become an, became an increasing priority across uh, nonprofit organizations in which we partnered. 
essentially, as you can imagine, our system, our, our product works the same way um, or in a very similar way when we're operating and partnering with food banks as it does when we're partnering with um, more traditional retailers. We have a location where we pick something up, we use really efficient logistics and delivery to transport it, and we make sure it ends up in the place that it's supposed to be delivered. What this looks like with um, food banks and with other organizations across the country is we identify the correct locations with food bank and hunger relief partners of where we're, we are intended to pick up the deliveries and send and dispatch dashers to, to arrive and pick up um, the orders, as you might call it. We then have these dashers uh, transport them. We often have the ability to batch them. So one dasher can pick up multiple items um, and make it more efficient for the on-site operations for the um, local organization. And then we confirm that it's delivered. So we go through the process of optionally communicating to the um, end recipient, that client or that neighbor, as well as providing the feedback loop to the organization itself to be able to um, have confidence that the item ended up where it was supposed to, to be. What's really exciting and, and what's been a, a true honor is that over the past, uh, this quarter, we actually uh, surpassed 1 million deliveries with nonprofit and government partners. Um, we translate this to approximately 21 million meals that have been delivered. Um, we've operated this process across 900 cities in the United States and Canada. Um, and what's really exciting and, and inspiring is also that we've determined that about 80% of these deliveries are made to communities of color. So for DoorDash, we really are motivated and inspired by this work. And we see this first million as very much just the first million. It's an enormous achievement, but we know that there's a lot of work to be done. And we know that there's far more opportunity to be able to reach um, food insecure households than just with 1 million deliveries. Um, now I have a video I'd like to share. So I'm gonna stop sharing and um, ask Melly Bea to share her screen if, if um, possible. Project Dash to me is really simple. It's, it's helping. It's helping people. It's helping families who are struggling. I've been in that situation, you know, years ago. And when you need a food box, and that food box comes to be able to feed your family, so being able to present that to other people, it has been good. It's kind of giving back some things that maybe that was given to me when I was younger. DoorDash has really allowed the emergency food system to expand in ways that it has never been able to do before. Um, you know, food banks across the county have been able to triple, quadruple the number of households that they're serving through their home delivery programs. Whereas before it was based on volunteer support, you know, now we have a reliable source of DoorDash drivers who can make these deliveries every week. I love the concept of Project Dash and what it's about and what it's doing for the community. It's not just a, a company that delivers food service, but also reach out to other people to get access to food. Being able to connect to a program through DoorDash to where, again, I could meet the needs of those who need it, to me was really important. and. It just made the most sense. Why not go out there and do it? In May of 2021, United Way of King County hit a milestone of 100,000 deliveries with Project Ash, which meant that we had delivered 100,000 boxes of groceries directly to the doorsteps of households. People have said that had it not been for this program, they would have lost their housing or they wouldn't have been able to feed their children. And so the, the resource that this program provides is really important. You set the boxes down, you knock on the door, and you go, hold up, these, these, these people needed food. This is the least that you can do. So it, it, it tends to make, it makes me feel good, but I, I think it makes me feel good that they're feeling good. Thanks, Melly Bay. I'm gonna reshare my screen. Just give me one moment. Well, I hope that um, I've really <laughs> become quite partial to that, that, that video. I think being a, a person who, like many other individuals, is often um, 
you know, sitting at a desk and doing things that I don't often get to see the outcomes of the work that's being completed. Um, it's really inspiring to get to see that. I know um, Julie has made an effort to ensure that she's been kind of on site to get to see some of these distributions and, and kind of understand what this, again, looks like in, in um in the real world, um, but it's always really exciting and inspiring to get to see, uh, again, truly the stories that come from this and, and the fact that it's not just the hunger relief organizations as well as the um, end recipients, those clients and those neighbors that are actually benefiting. It's also the dashers that are having a wonderful experience getting to have um, earning opportunities while also helping their, their neighbors and their communities. Um, so now I'll share a little bit more on our delivery operations um, and how this actually works. Um, Essentially how we end up working is that we partner um, with our organizations to submit, um, have an order be placed. This can be done either through a Google Sheet, through our integration with Link to Feed, um, and, and then we take that information and we're able to upload it and ingest it into our um, DoorDash Drive system. From there, our, we have drivers, dashers that are dispatched and assigned to the order, and they're routed to go directly to the food pantry or the location where they're picking up the, the food or the products. Um, the food pantry, the hunger relief organization ends up passing off the actual order. And then throughout the delivery, the um, client or the neighbor has the ability to optionally receive status updates through text. Um, upon delivery, again, the individual it can be contacted by the dasher through a masked phone number should there be any questions, and we're able to provide proof of delivery as well as, um, in most cases, a photo um, confirming the location of the delivery. Lastly, we're able to partner with our organizations to make sure that there's understanding of um, the reporting, the outcomes, the metrics, um, such that for any internal processes, there can be uh, you know, uh, consistent and reliable data sharing. So I shared a little bit about the order ingestion process. We also do have live order tracking that can be available through um, our DoorDash portal. There can be orders that are submitted on demand as well as um, the ability to click into any order as it's happening to understand um, where the dasher is, when the, uh, when the order has actually been dropped off as well as the follow-up after the fact to view that photo. And you can always look back at specific deliveries to be able to identify um, when something was delivered and, and understand, again, the details of every single delivery. Um, now I'm going to pass it to Julie. Um, and excited for her to share a little bit about the work that we've done with Northern Illinois Food Bank. Thanks so much, Brittany. Appreciate it. Um, to start, I'm just going to spend a minute or two uh, making sure we all kind of know what food banks do and who is Northern Illinois Food Bank. So the first slide, um, I love this slide. This just shows you the process of what food banks do and how we make sure that all of our neighbors have enough to eat. So we're a food distributor, Northern Illinois Food Bank, as is one of, we're one of more than 200 food banks across the country. All food banks are food distributors out to the nonprofits um, within our service areas. We also are food providers. We will provide meals and groceries directly to our neighbors. Um, we receive resources. Resources come into the food bank, um, financial donations, food donations, and resources from Feeding America. About 206 food banks across the country are members of Feeding America, and we cover every county within America. The food that comes into us is normally donated, purchase, or government food. We make sure it's safe and within the right um, packaging to go out to our neighbors, and then we distribute that out to food pantries, soup kitchens, and other feeding sites. These might be senior sites, kid feeding sites, um, areas where families go to get food. Um, we know that hunger is real, and sadly there's about 30 million Americans who are food insecure. And why they're food insecure, it's tied to systemic racism, employment, jobs, education, health, and other factors. And so our end goal is always to make sure that that neighbor gets the food that they need to live a healthy and active life. On the next slide, a little bit more about Northern Illinois Food Bank. Um, we believe in full bellies. We believe that every person has value and potential and that the way that they achieve that is by having enough to eat um, and having enough opportunity. And so we are a proud member of Feeding America. We cover 13 counties in the suburbs of Chicago, going all the way out into the rural areas of Northern Illinois. Last year, we proudly provided the equivalent of 100 million meals out to our neighbors in need through our network of more than 900 food pantries, soup kitchens, and feeding programs. We have four distribution centers across our 13 counties, and they're marked with those little green icons that you can see on the screen. The next slide, um, 
In September of this year, the USDA came out with their food insecurity study in America. As has been true historically, this report shared that 61% of Americans who are food insecure don't come to the charitable food sector for help. 61%, that's six out of 10 Americans who are hungry, don't come to food banks and food pantries to get the nutritious groceries and meals that they need. That's a question that's really been on our minds over the last few years. Why are they not coming to us? So working together with Feeding America and IDEO, which is a human-centered design research firm, we've done some studies around this. And what we have learned is there are very real barriers to access. Either someone doesn't know about us, they don't even know that we exist, if they do know about us, they don't know what to expect if they come to us. The second reason is they cannot get to us. They physically cannot get to us. They are homebound or they don't have the transportation or the services that we're offering are not at times and at places that they can get to. The third and the hardest to overcome is shame and stigma. It is too hard to say that they need help. It's so funny to me, sadly funny, that in America when you lose your job, you will tell anyone that you apply for unemployment. Um, we just had Halloween. So many of us got our, our costumes at Goodwill. We'll tell people we went to Goodwill, but for us to say that we went to a food pantry for help is still something that is hard for us to do. So that's a question that plagues us. And the question that we're trying to answer is how can we here at Northern Illinois Food Bank serve more individuals, get those six and 10 people to come to us with approaches that honor them and that addresses these barriers to access. So on the next slide, one of our responses is a program called My Pantry Express. This is an online food pantry that has been designed to mirror the, non, the for-profit grocery sector. All those different shopping experiences that you and I take advantage of, whether we're shopping within a bricks and mortar or more likely online doing click and collect or having it delivered to us. So we launched in 2019 our online food pantry, My Pantry Express. It is this private online shopping experience. You can go and pick up your food from a familiar location at a convenient time, and now you can also get it delivered by DoorDash. And because we know of the stigma, we have made sure that the eligibility requirements are very, very low. All we ask for someone, if they want to utilize My Pantry Express, is to check a box that says that they're in need today and provide us with their first name, their last initial, a phone number, and an email. On the next slide. This is showing you in pictures what it looks like. And it's so simple, you all know this. Um, these are some real neighbors that utilize My Pantry Express. They learn of the service and they choose to go online at mypantryexpress.org and place an order. There are usually 40 items. We always have fresh produce, proteins, dairy, and shelf stable items. They can create their own order and they can submit that order. They can pick where they're going to get that food or um, they can pick if it's going to be delivered at that time. Then that order comes to the food bank. We have a fulfillment center here at our main headquarters in Geneva, Illinois, where we have volunteers six days a week fulfilling those individual orders. Those orders are then put on one of our trucks. It goes out to our distribution sites or our delivery sites um, and then it's delivered or the neighbor comes to pick it up. On the next slide, what's so cool about this program is that we partner with all these great organizations. We have trusted partners, trusted community partners, we have trusted distribution partners, and then innovative partners. In order to learn about the program, we partner with folks like social service organizations or low-income housing organizations, healthcare organizations, and they help us get the word out to the populations that they serve so that they know that they can come to us. For distribution, we have some great partners in Walmart and Goodwill. We have schools as well, and then DoorDash. And so these are all, again, very trusted names, right? This is all about building the neighbor's trust so that they'll come to us, and places that are familiar, places that they might access in their everyday life. And then we have our innovation partners, um, wonderful folks like IDEO, See What I Mean, UTech, and Feeding America. They're helping us create and grow the program. The next slide shows you all the places in which we're operating across our 13 counties. Um, if you're not familiar with the Chicagoland area, the area to the right along the lake, that is Cook County, that's the urban area, city of Chicago. Again, we're all in the suburbs going all the way out about 90% across the state. 
past Rockford into Stevenson County. All the stars are pickup locations, and then you can see the four distribution sites we have for DoorDash. To dive in a little bit more on the DoorDash model on the next slide, we have the MPX model, which means that someone places their individual order, they choose to have it delivered to them, and DoorDash picks it up and delivers it. We also are using the DoorDash services at our food bank owned food pantry called Winnebago Community Market. This is a slightly different model where we have neighbors that have typically shopped the market. They can choose to have their food delivered to them and they actually get delivered pre-packed boxes of food from the food bank. We started our pilots in May of this year. Since that time, we have delivered nearly 6,000 orders thanks to DoorDash. What's very exciting to us is if you think of those six out of 10 folks, 30 to 35% of the folks that we're serving through the DoorDash deliveries coming from my pantry and Winnebago Community Market are new to the food bank. We're eating into that six out of 10 folks that aren't coming to us. Um, we're also really excited that we've been able to reach new communities that we haven't been able to serve in the past. The homebound individuals, many of whom are seniors, and then we also have a really special partnership with one of our veterans hospital. And we're able to serve more of our vets, especially those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we're not done. Um, what I've learned in working with Brittany and DoorDash is it's all about expansion and growth, which is awesome. We love that. Um, we are currently, we have these four sites um, through which we're doing delivery. We'd like to expand delivery. We'd like to cover all of our service area with delivery and have it at most, if not all of our MPX sites. Um, one of the barriers for us in terms of growth over the last two years has been technology. Um, we created MyPantryExpress.org. We are a food bank, not a technology company. We have literally said prayers. Can we just have someone come alongside us and help us create some really great Silicon Valley-like technology? And that's what Brittany and her team are doing with us. We are modifying the storefront platform for food banks um, so that we can get out of the tech business and we can add so many great new features. Uh, not only all the great delivery features that Brittany shared with you, um, but also an even stronger, better shopping experience for our neighbors. The ability to franchise this model with our food pantries. So when you look at food banks and our distribution, normally about 75 to 80% of the distributions are happening through the food pantry. So we really want to get our food pantries involved. That means that not only would they serve as distribution or pickup spots, but that they would also be able to fulfill orders on site. And the storefront technology has all of that for us. So we're working with Brittany and team on that and are hoping to launch that in the next few weeks. Finally, I wanted to close with a couple slides showing you our vision, our dreams about growth. Um, within food banking, we talk about programs and we talk about distribution models. Programs are usually really awesome initiatives that are trying to reach a very specific community and might max out at about one or two million meals a year. A distribution model is something that reaches and reaches thousands of individuals and provides tens of millions of meals every year. And so what we want to do is take my pantry express and our partnership with DoorDash from a really great program to a new new distribution model. Our goal um, is that we really want to disrupt the charitable food system. Again, the six and 10 people that aren't coming to us if we can have a system that truly mirrors the for-profit grocery shopping experience, we feel we can reach those six and 10 people. So um, on this slide, what you're seeing is um, in Chicago, there's a famous quote um, from Daniel Burnham who built the white city back in the turn of the century from 1800s to 1900s and it was make no little plans. And it goes on to say, cause they don't have the passion to stir man's heart. And so these are our make little, no little plan plans. Um, you'll see the, Orange bar is showing you total meals that we want to distribute by year. Um, we're in fiscal year 22 for the food bank right now. We want to do almost double what we did last year and get to 2 million meals. And then next year, we want to double that plus to get to 5 million meals. We haven't really put a timeline on that vision, but we'd love in the next three to four years to hit 10 million meals annually through this program. And to me, that's when we've disrupted the charitable food sector. In order to do that, we have to do a whole lot more orders through My Pantry Express. We did 34,000 last year. We're, we're aiming for nearly 60 this year. In order to achieve vision, we have to get to almost a quarter of a million orders. The next slide 
shows you um, how many sites we need in order to achieve that and how many weekly orders we need to provide. So um, again, you can kind of see we're sitting at about 24 locations right now. Um, we've just surpassed a million, not a million, oh, I wish, a thousand orders a week um, for this fiscal year. We want to get those weekly orders up to nearly 5,000 a week um, in the vision, and we want to add more locations. And the locations that we want to add are those agency locations. Um, we want to make sure that we can really scale this by bringing them into the fold. And we have five agency sites right now, and we want to at least double, if not triple that over the next couple of years. So that was a whole lot and a little bit of time, um, but we still have some time, which was Brittany and my intent. So at this point, I think we'll open it up for questions. I think that's great. And actually, Julie, I don't think you, uh, Julie and I have become good friends over the past few months as we've, as we've been talking and, and um, dreaming big with this all. And I don't think Julie knows this, but I have a whiteboard in my home office and on it says, make no little plans. So no fun fact, I do, I do. So I'm right here with you. I'm glad we're, <laughs> no, no surprise there. <laughs> no surprise. Um, but yeah, I, I would love, um, you know, if there are any kind of questions, um, Feel free to take yourself off mute, or if you're more comfortable, type them in the chat. Um, we're excited to kind of discuss this. Or if not, you can hear Julie and I gabbing about things. It looks like we have one question. Um, Abby asked, um, how would an organization get involved with the DRIVE program? Actually, that's a great question, and here's my email address at the end. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, we're actively and eagerly growing, and um, and expanding our reach to be able to partner with more and more organizations. Um, so please reach out. Um, we're also uh, working really collaboratively across DoorDash as well as within our own team to, to make this process easier and smoother. Um, we have existing process to do home delivery in a pretty um, straightforward way. And Northern Illinois is, is our really remarkable anchor partner and guinea pig to be able to kind of partner and make sure we, we build out, you know, client neighbor online ordering, kind of a client facing solution that you know, our hope is for exactly all the reasons that Julie shared, um, that there'll be a lot of opportunity for, um, for neighbors to have direct digital online interactions, to be able to have greater access, feel lower barriers um, uh, with the charitable food system. And so, um, so we're excited, you know, not just for storefront, although we think it's going to be really kind of pivotal in the, the months and years to come, um, but also uh, more broadly, just to be able to help service the need to connect to clients. I see a question in the chat from Sue about what is the cost per meal, which is a great question. Um, and will that change as we scale? So right now, the cost per meal for my Pantry Express is about 70 cents per meal which is higher than where we want it. Um, our goal is to get it to about 30 cents per meal. And we're basing that on the mobile market or mobile pantry model that we have, which is also a pretty robust program here at our food bank. Um, we feel we can get it down to that level that that's something that would be more sustainable for us as a food bank. The number one driver for us in cost is food. Of the 40 items right now, about 70 to 80% of those are purchased product. And that's because we're trying to make sure that we have a very consistent, stable, dependable inventory. So when people get online and they order the food, that they can make sure that they're receiving what they've ordered. And um, we need to get that down. Our goal over the next year is to get that down to 50% donated versus purchased food. And we think we can do that if, when we get the DoorDash technology coupled with a inventory system that we're implementing currently here at the food bank. Food banks are great at inventory, but it's normally B2B. Right, is going from the food bank to another organization that's going to distribute the food. We're implementing business to business. We're implementing a business to, to customer um, inventory system, Microsoft Business Central, in order to achieve that. So when we do that, we think we can get there. Um, I would say the other costs that we have been recognizing, realizing, um, is the cost of the team to manage the program. Right, We need the team that's working with the customer facing versus order fulfillment, versus distribution, versus technology development. So that has been an investment for us at this food bank. Um, but we believe that the model is sustainable and will be able to be achievable at the 10 million meals a year. I 
I should note on the, probably it's helpful to note on the delivery side, we, um, we're partnering with DoorDash and several other food banks across the country um, in um, uh, partially or fully subsidizing these deliveries with the intention of making sure that, you know, we don't believe that this is a problem that food banks on their own should solve. Um, the, you know, the ability, it were in the logistics business and part of that is figuring out how to make logistics sustainable and cost effective and, you know, actually able to be part of operating models. Um, and so we very much are kind of standing alongside Julie and her team in terms of determining how do we ensure that this is a long term, um, again, sustainable uh, solution um, and definitely like an evolution of how food can be distributed from um, uh, the charitable food to be distributed. Um, Luann, great question on, are you currently operating in North Carolina? I'm, I think well, that might be targeted more towards me than Julie. Um, since Northern Illinois doesn't quite reach that far, but so um, we uh, so we have we can operate in any um, location where we have dashers, um, and I should actually reposition that to we want to be operating in every single community in which we have dashers, and luckily again um, today that gives the ability to reach 95% of Americans, and um, that includes across every single state um, and across the other countries in which we operate um, today: Australia, Canada, and Japan. And so we do have operations in North Carolina. We have done a few um, local partnerships with different hunger relief organizations in the state, um, but always looking to expand and grow. So again, please, um, please reach out. Yes, Lenny, you want to connect. <laughs> I know. I should tell a little bit of a story. I think that, um, it, it, and I'll, we'll keep on gabbing unless people give us kind of Q and A to kind of follow up on, but um, for a little bit of context, when I first uh, started in this role about a year ago, started diving into the world of food banks to better understand how the justice could take, play a role in it. Um, and pretty quickly, I ended up stumbling upon Julie's email. I think I like coldly linked out, LinkedIn reached out to her and then grabbed her email um, and, uh, and ended up within a day, I think she wrote back and we had a meeting the following day and we were meeting in person the following day because I'm actually, or the following week because I'm actually based in Chicago. Um, and I think that what was really inspiring for me is Julie and her team very much have the perspective of let's not settle for what we have today. Let's think about the best solution with the, the neighbor in mind and the end recipient in mind, which is very much you know, similar to the way that DoorDash operates. One of our core values is be um, customer focused, not com com be customer obsessed, not competitor focused. Probably saying that incorrectly while I'm, I'm on live uh, a live uh, uh, interview right now, but for us, I think it's very much like do what's right by the end recipient, and and you'll have success. And so I think that it's very much the same kind of perspective that um, Julian's team have had, um, and being really disciplined and, and focused on that outcome. Yeah, I think one of the the best learnings for us over the last three years has been if we can normalize the terrible food sector, folks will feel more comfortable coming to us. Um, you know, I went out, I, I went out and was talking to a lot of different organizations about what they serve as pickup locations. Because to be quite honest, until Brittany came along, I kept telling folks, we can do click and collect, I don't know how we do delivery. You know, to Sue's question, like, how do you pay for that? Um, how do you figure that out? And you can, it was just something that I felt we needed to get the click and collect model. Let's get that down and then we can dream even bigger. And thankfully, Brittany allows that. Um, but, you know, it's the normalization. And so we went out, we talked to a lot of different folks and we were testing, you know, if it was coming to a food pantry, if it was going to a school, if it was going to Goodwill, if it was going to Walmart. And Walmart has been winning. Walmart wins. And I think DoorDash, we're opening up these sites. I think Walmart and DoorDash are going to win because that's where folks go every day. Every day we're ordering our lunches from DoorDash so they can come to us. And everybody knows what to expect when they go to a Walmart. And so it's nothing against the other places. Those are great, trusted, awesome places. But if we're gonna try and reach folks and meet them where they're at, I think we have to start by, first of all, making it seem very, very familiar. And second of all, removing all those barriers. We are so good as a network of asking folks for a whole bunch of information before we serve them. And our philosophy, particularly with My Pantry Express, is we're going to serve you and we're going to build your trust. And then as we need to, we will ask you for some more information so we can learn how to serve you better. Um, and I think that's just kind of changing. Again, when we think about disruption and, and changing the charitable food sector, those are some paradigm shifts that we need to undertake 
so that we can reach six out of 10 people. I keep saying if we were like Amazon, we'd be going crazy at that market share, right? My gosh, we can grow so dramatically. Um, I, I really feel it's incumbent on us to do that with the normalization um, by making it more anonymous, building trust first, and then we gotta keep offering choice. It's been so challenging as we've been looking at, as we've been living through the COVID, right? And wearing the mask and having the drive through and trying to move more food. And yeah, what we learned, we went to boxes in my pantry in the height of the pandemic and folks started leaving us. They're like, no, thank you. They liked the choice. And so how do we have enough choice, the right variety of food, the right types of food, the foods that not only that they need, but they want that meets, meets their cultural traditions, their family preferences. Um, how do we do that through choice? And what's so great is I think as we build out storefront, as we work with DoorDash, as we continue to talk, we have a whole neighbor council that informs this work that we're gonna be able to build this in a way that will make sure that we're serving every person in need. Wouldn't it be great if in five years, just like people say, oh, I signed up for unemployment, I lost my job. They said, I'm having a hard time, so I went to the food pantry. That's the vision. And I think actually just to elaborate on that, on Dave made a comment here about, um, the, thank you for this as well, Dave, that there was a study in, in Indianapolis on stigma and not people not using services and, and homebound folks having challenges. And I think, you know, Julie, your comments really hit the nail on the head there. Um, I also think we had one uh, Northern Illinois neighbor who ended up mentioning they you, they were you know in need and, and benefited from the Winnebago community market um, distribution and were curious what the packaging would be like. And they were fine with kind of there being something that said Northern Illinois, but just wanted to kind of understand um, they weren't quite sure what their, what their neighbors would think. Um, and it was really kind of fascinating to see how grateful they were when they heard it was just, you know, it was grocery bags delivered by a dasher, you know, nobody would really know. So, um, you know, definitely, not, you know, pretend, we would like to make sure that they you know, feel comfortable and proud stating, obviously, that they're receiving food from uh, the Charitable Food Network, which is there for this exact reason. But it's a step in the right direction that at least they felt like they could reach out and access it. Um, so I think that was a win. Yeah. Um, We're oh, is there? A, there is one question, but you go first, Julie, and then I'll address it. I was just going to say, there's this tension that we're experiencing right now where how do we Right, food banks are a trusted brand within the community, right? Like people believe that food banks will help, and yet they don't necessarily want they don't necessarily want to say they're affiliated with us. So we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we go out and message about this program and what are the words we're using? And what we're learning is um, that we we don't wanna we don't wanna talk about if you're in need, come to us. We're learning like let's make Northern Illinois Food Bank a small kind of subset, so that it's kind of like a what do you call it? like something that uh, verifies that it's real but not a big part of it you know some of the taglines we're starting to look at we it used to be you know your charitable food for when you need it or something like that and now we're just saying it's food for energy it's food for all it's food for the spirit you know it's kind of that kind of stuff and um hopefully those messages will resonate with folks and not feel they won't feel the shame and stigma when they see that and they'll be willing to order from us I think that's so true. I think, and I think you're again. I'm, I, I think this is the fun part of kind of dreaming big and figuring out how we kind of all play a role together in in getting there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, all right, Elaine asked the question that I I am surprised it took this long to be asked. I get this, this question asked with frequency uh, about how much it costs for nonprofits and government agencies to utilize Project Dash services. And I also realized as the video is um, uh, displaying, I didn't properly tee up what exact exactly Project Dash is and means. Um, but Project Dash said simply is um, is uh, delivery services and online tools provided by um, DoorDash to nonprofit um, organizations and government agencies. And so it's kind of like the, the area of our work in which we focus on kind of um, with these kind of particular partners with the outcome being, um, again, increasing access um, to needed services um, for kind of the organizations that really you know, fuel um, fuel much of our our um, you know the important kind of services provided to, to um, citizens. Um, so in terms of cost, we actually do uh, either partially or fully subsidize these for organizations that we work with. So as you might imagine, um, you know this is this is not a, a, you know something that we're uh, seeking to build this out as as um, 
as something that would make it preventative for organizations to partner with us. And so our approach very much is understanding with each organization kind of the needs, the opportunity, how we can collaborate and grow together, um, then identifying you know, how we can make that sustainable. Um, it's also something that for, it's very important to note that while we do partially or fully subsidize these deliveries, we also do ensure that the dashers are fairly compensated for these deliveries. Um, and so that's very important for us and for our team. We stay really close um, with it and, and we very positively kind of heard and learned from dashers how much they enjoy these um, deliveries because they're able to um, both have earnings while also, um, you know, again, helping out their neighbors and their communities. And so um, it's definitely been kind of a win-win from that perspective and, and something that as we you know, continue to grow and scale um, the work that we're doing. We can have more opportunities for more dashers and in the hopes of being all dashers have the ability to kind of help, um, you know, complete these deliveries um, as as they as they are able to. Um, and yeah, I see a question about senior utilization. Um, and actually, um, when we first were doing the business plan around my pantry, we were very curious about access to technology and would, you know, the older generation who perhaps we think don't use technology as readily, would they be, um, would they use it? And and the answer to both of those is yes and yes. Um, most folks, um, you know, the, the glowing rectangle is our lifeline and you need to have it for all parts of your life. And so regardless of income, you know, typically you have access to a phone and you can order. Um, you also have access to internet through other you know, libraries and schools and whatnot. Um, for seniors, we have found that um, that they absolutely do use it. We act, we actually use it in different, you know, some of the senior housing. Um, we're starting to offer it out to them. Um, what we do find is seniors who can't is that they come together and there might be one person who can and they help one another, which we see a lot. Um, we see orders come under one email for multiple people. And so we know that that's one of the strategies are using, but we have we have seen kind of across the board all ages um, utilize it to success. All right, looks like Pete is sneaking in a question. Um, do corporate partners support nonprofits costs access or do DoorDash hold funds in an internal nonprofit foundation? Um, so uh, I would say it's, um, if I'm reading your question correctly, um, it's it's neither. Essentially, we're providing um, you know the the deliveries again at a subsidized or discounted cost, um, or fully or partially subsidized um, cost, and so it's more just either kind of cost incurred cost incurred by by DoorDash, um, and and as we um, kind of continue to grow this program, I'm sure we'll kind of increasingly develop that, but but that's how we're managing it today. Yeah, so like we would say, like I would say to Brittany, if she would like, which we haven't really talked about this, you know, if you want to record and say, you know, th these are the number of distribution or deliveries that we've done for Northern Illinois Food Bank, we would consider it an in-kind contribution. And we would acknowledge that to DoorDash. Yeah. So I think we have, that's a great question. Um, and honestly, you know, something we're, we're thinking about what exactly that looks like for the future as we do increase our work in this space. Yeah. Um, so I think that we're about at the end. So Malibu, I promised I'd kick it back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you both, Julie and Brittany. So I'm just going to do a little housekeeping here. Up next is a short 15 minute break, and then we'll begin the next set of four workshop sessions providing solutions, best practices, and toolkits you can start to utilize within your respective communities. To join one of these four sessions, you can click the workshops in your navigation bar to the left of your screen and click enter the session. That concludes this workshop. To exit this session, you can click on the red phone icon at the bottom of your screen and then click leave. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.